Welcome to the Nichols Tax Update Podcast, Issue 2139. Here's the regular disclaimer. Please read it. I don't need to read it to you. I do want to emphasize the third paragraph here, however, because I always acknowledge the value in preparation of this program, and in fact, in everything I do, of my subscription to Tax Notes Today. Tax Notes Today is published by tax analysts. In my opinion, the preeminent source of reliable information coming out of Washington, D.C. on the federal tax law. What's in this week's edition? Six items. No imputed interest on annuity payments negotiated between former spouses as part of their property settlement. It makes sense, but it's interesting to see it in black and white. Then more explanation of a partnership's need for both designated individual and a partnership representative. I, I picked this because if you just read it, you may be misled. And so I want to make sure that we all understand after this week what our responsibilities are for picking a partnership representative. Next, the IRS really wants your comments on the final ownership change rules for C corporations that limit, limit the use by the acquiring corporation of net operating loss carry forwards, tax credits, and uh, other tax benefits accrued by the selling corporation uh, to be used by the buyer or limited by the uh, by use by the buyer under code sections 382 and 383. And then the IRS has a legal memorandum for us, but not as broad as some believe. Sometimes this stuff gets out of the IRS and uh, we read it and we get all excited about it and they have to come out and say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't misinterpret it. We didn't mean anything except what we wrote on the paper. And that's one. this is one of those things. The IRS uh, recalls our attention to a web page explaining the required review of large refunds a joint committee review. Finally, this week, a district court in Missouri ignores, the district of Missouri is in the Eighth Circuit. They ignore a ruling out of the Eleventh Circuit in a state of Blount in deciding an estate tax case where insurance proceeds were used to redeem the stock of a corporation. I think it's interesting and well worth our, well worth our, well worth our attention, my goodness. My tongue is wrapped around my teeth this week. Here we have the parties and their attorneys with papers negotiating a settlement. Letter ruling 2021-13-7005, released on the, 9th, on the 17th of September. This payment arrangement includes non-taxable transfers between former spouses incident to divorce. We know that's not taxable under section 1041. But the letter ruling says, by the way, these payments will not result in taxable gifts under section 2501 either. They're not, uh, they're not considered taxable transactions under 1041 and gifts between spouses are not taxable. And that's a provision in 2501, but there's more. No portion of the payments will be characterized as imputed interest under either code section 483, which applies to installment payments, 1274, which applies to original issue discount, or section 7872, which applies to below market loans, gift loans, and that sort of thing. Payments by the taxpayer to the spouse under the annuity payment arrangement will constitute transfers for full and adequate consideration and money or money's worth, and that's in quotation marks because that wording is specifically lifted right out of the regulations to make sure that it will not be subject to 2516. Then finally, in the event of the taxpayer's death, any payments that remain will be treated as a claim against the taxpayer's estate. So no income tax, no gift tax, no estate tax. Pretty straightforward. I don't know what this lady wants, but I would give her anything she asked for, I think. If she was a partnership representative and I were the IRS agent, I would just fold my tent and stop the examination right then and there. The, the, here we have a couple of terms that have been thrown around, thrown around by people who don't bother maybe to learn all they need to learn. A designated individual, partnerships must select a designated individual if they have selected an entity 
under the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, uh, or two, whatever it was, 2000, yeah, 2015, if they have selected a, an entity to be the partnership representative, which they can, they must have a designated individual who has a substantial presence in the United States to speak for that partnership representative and have absolute authority to deal with the Internal Revenue Service. So if the partnership designates an entity as a partnership representative, there is no more uh, tax matters partner. It must also designate a designated individual who will have a, substanti a substantial presence in the U.S. All right. How do we get that tangled up? Do we have to be? Does this apply to every partnership? Well, unless you dig into it, you might be misled. A partnership must designate a partnership representative unless it is an eligible partnership and makes an annual election out of what's called the partnership audit regime on a timely filed form 1065. An eligible partnership is one with a hundred or fewer partners, all of whom are either C corporations, foreign entities that would be treated as a C corporation, if they were domestic S corporations or estates of deceased partners. A partnership that has a partnership as a partner cannot elect out of the partnership audit regime, no matter how few partners it has. So most of your clients that are partnerships are going to be eligible partnerships. They have fewer than 100 partners. All of their partners are either individuals or corporations or S corporations or trusts uh, or, or estates. I'm sorry, estates of deceased partners, not trusts. And they will be then eligible to elect out. The box, the check box for electing out is part of the Form 1065. Next, I love this cartoon. Our goal is right before the old collapses, we jump to the new. <laughs> so this corporation is looking to sell itself. Corporation, corporations that are sold, where there's a change in control, must report an ownership change under the tax law as it has been serially amended. There's a limitation on net operating losses and built-in losses that's imposed by Code Section 382. Realization of the benefit of losses is limited to a tax-exempt rate applied to the fair market value of the acquisition, which might not be much if they have huge NOLs. Then we have to deal with the capital loss carryover and the carryover of various other tax, various tax credits that's section 383. So these two code sections, 382 and 383, will govern the tax treatment of net operating losses, built-in losses, and various tax credits and capital loss carry forwards following a change in control of a loss corporation. Sounds easy when you say it fast, right? The IRS cautions that some practitioners have misinterpreted an internal legal memorandum. The depreciation add back is not as broad as some have suggested. So the IRS rushes to correct our misunderstanding. Don't go beyond the four corners of the document. That's a legal term. Don't, don't go beyond what's there in, in the black print on the white paper. Concerning the effect of a depreciation adjustment on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act's interest deduction limitation. So what happened here, and let me change the slide here. Well, this is the interaction between a taxpayer's depreciation tax accounting method change and a section 481A adjustment and the effect of that adjustment on the allowable interest deduction. Here we go. The taxpayer in the memo filed a 2017 tax return treating some property as seven year property. In 2020, they had a change of heart and corrected that position to classify the property as five-year property. So on its 2020 return, they correctly included an accounting method change with a taxpayer favorable section 481A adjustment. 
that claimed more depreciation. The IRS concluded back then that the taxpayer could also use that extra depreciation to increase its adjusted taxable income, its ATI. Well, your adjusted taxable income is a depreciation and it's a, depreci a depreciation add back. So your adjusted, the, the adjusted taxable income looks like you got the benefit twice, but you didn't. In this example, the 481A adjustment is allowed to retain the character of the underlying adjustment, but the IRS has cautioned that will not always be the case. A 481A adjustment has no specific uh, character as to the item that gave rise to that adjustment. We should remember that, right? We don't have anything else to remember. Let's remember that. $2 million, big number. $5 million, even bigger number, right? Large refunds. Oh, if I claimed a refund of $2 million or $5 million, or I have a issue, I filed a claim, the IRS has got an audit adjustment that I'm disputing, $2 million, $5 million. The, uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation, by law, must receive a report. First time I ran into this was back in, in the uh, late 1960s, when the threshold was $500,000, not $2 million or $5 million. And uh, I had an IRS agent that had a speech impediment. And he was telling me he was, when he called, he said that he had to do a John Carmody uh, examination. I didn't know who John Carmody was, but I told him to come ahead on. And uh, he'd actually been in our office for two days uh, working before I realized that I had misunderstood the poor man's uh, explanation or his calling of the uh, designation of a joint committee in anyway. event. I, I remember it. That's how I remember this. By the way, the IRS has a web page for you. Here's where they explain the whole thing. This link. If you have a tax dispute, you file a claim for refund, more than $2 million or $5 million, your net operating loss carryback, which is more likely the situation. You've got an NOL carryback, which has generated a claim for refund because we had a lot of profitable companies that flew into a storm of pandemic issues and had a loss, had to claim that claim that loss back, and you've got a, an enormous refund, you are going to have a, a highly skilled, highly trained auditor from the Internal Revenue Service visit you to audit the claim and make a report to the Joint Committee. Maybe you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't mean to get involved in something from Washington, D.C., but you are now. Acquiring an ownership in a closely held C corporation involves, can involve a buy-sell. You need a method for valuing the stock, a mechanism for payment, you need a source of funds. We usually value the stock with an appraisal or by some kind of an agreement. The mechanism for payment could be the corporation redeems the shares or other owners purchase the shares. That'll be a significant difference and can lead to a change in control of the corporation. And with a method of valuing stock, you can hire an outside appraiser or you can, when you got together in the first place, you can have an agreement and you can update your agreement periodically by signing a, an updated agreement on the value. Where do the funds come from? Corporations cash, if you're going to redeem, right, cash, bank loan, or life insurance. Now those three yellow, those three green X's are there because what's coming up involves an agreement to value the stock of a closely held company that was not followed by the shareholders. They didn't annually update that, that agreement. The mechanism for payment here was going to be, and I got that X in the wrong place, the mechanism for payment was going to be a redemption of the shares of a deceased shareholder, and the money was going to come from life insurance. So once again, I've got the, the green X in the wrong place there. It should go on redemption. So we understand this example. Uh, one of the shareholders died. That's what the coffin is for. And now we need to claim the money from the life insurance policy. 
Uh, this is Thomas Connolly, uh, the Thomas Connolly as the uh, executor mm -hmm. of the estate of his brother. The IRS valued the stock of this closely held company to include the, the $3 million of in proceed, insurance proceeds that they got when Tom died. The estate argued, and, and the corporation is going to redeem the shares with the insurance money. The estate argues that's a wash. That's $3 million in and $3 million out. The estate's position as to valuation was damaged, in this case, by the shareholders' failure to execute the annual certificates of valuation. They didn't document their agreement to value the shares. Now, before we go too much further, this decision against the taxpayer is appealable to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Eleventh Circuit addressed this issue in Blount or Blunt versus Commissioner, and the taxpayer here argued that Blunt should be controlling in the Eleventh Circuit, even though it was controlling in the Eighth. The Eleventh Circuit simply had not addressed the issue. This is where we can get in trouble if we are not careful about our choice of authority and our arguments. So to control the value of a decedent's property for estate tax purposes, you got a buy-sell agreement and must meet three statutory requirements. And this is quoting the statute directly. It's a bona fide business arrangement. It's not a device to transfer the property to members of the family. Its terms are comparable to similar arrangements entered into by persons in an arm's length transaction. The IRS argued that no reasonable person would enter into an agreement that allowed a stranger take, take control of a corporation with the insurance proceeds on the life of the other shareholder. When you think about that, I suppose that makes sense. But there's more. There's always more, right? A buy-sell agreement must also meet several additional requirements. The offering price must be fixed and determinable under the agreement, but it wasn't because they had not properly annually executed an agreement on the offering price. The, the agreement was legally binding. It was entered into for a bona fide business reason. It wasn't a substitute for a testamentary disposition, although the IRS argued that it was because the person who benefited from the arrangement was the decedent's brother. This is going to be appealed for sure. Uh, you got, you're going to have conflict between the circuits here. Uh, it's $3 million of estate value. That's at least a million dollars of tax. That's worth the fight. Well, thank you. My goodness, I surprised myself. I'm surprised we're done. Thank you so much for your continued uh, support and your, uh, and your joining me every week. I enjoy these. Remember, we're, we're not through the pandemic yet, so stay safe. We, uh, we need each other.